Known as the most diverse fuel on the planet, American biodiesel is good for jobs, good for the environment, and good for national defense. Tonight, we take a closer look at the history and the future of the nation's first advanced biofuel and the benefits of using biodiesel in the ag industry. Good evening and welcome to Rural America Live. I'm Christina Loren. Experts from the National Biodiesel Board join us tonight as they share their experiences using the product and how farmers and ranchers can reap the benefits of this fast growing industry. And you are an important part of this show. In just a little bit, we're going to be opening up our phone lines to take your questions and comments about biodiesel live. But first, let's meet tonight's guest. Joining us is Greg Anderson, the governing board member of NBB and soybean farmer from Nebraska. We also have Steve Howell, senior technical advisor with the National Biodiesel Board and fellow of the American Society of Testing and Materials. Thank you both for joining us tonight. Thank you, Christine. It's great to be here to talk about America's advanced biofuel. It's great to be here. Well, we are excited. We have a lot to go over tonight. We know a lot of soybean farmers are watching. We're happy that you're with us. First, though, let's start with a little bit of background on each of you, Greg. Well, it's Christina. I'm a soybean farmer from northeast Nebraska near Newman Grove, which is in the uh, east central northeast corner of the state, about 120 miles northwest of Omaha. I grow primarily soybeans, but also have alfalfa hay, uh, grass hay, and an Angus cow calf operation. I have uh, spring calving cows and some uh, late summer, uh, early fall calving cows. Just had a couple of calves born this morning, Aww. so I'm excited <laughs> about that to see that next calf crop come in. But uh, I farm the same ground that my great great grandfather. Uh, homesteaded back in 1873, so nearing 150 years of a family farm, and I know a lot of our viewers can relate to a family farm, yes. certainly. I first became interested in biodiesel and learned of it back in 1992, where I visited uh, St. Louis Airport, Lambert Field. They were using biodiesel in their equipment, uh, delivery trucks, and maintenance vehicles uh, at the airport there. I was intrigued by the fuel. I needed to learn more about it, and that's kind of how I got involved in the soybean uh, biodiesel industry and get, get got on the uh, board there and started promoting it really. Excellent. All right, Steve, how did you get into the biodiesel business? So I'm a chemical engineer by training, grew up in Ames, Iowa, so I'm a Midwestern boy at heart, live in Kansas City now, and uh, I started working for a large petroleum company doing ways to expand petroleum refineries and outside the refinery, however. So I looked at biodiesel as a potential opportunity to, to do fuels, but not do it in a traditional refinery. And so uh, I started a small consulting firm in, in 1993. I uh, became the, the technical director for the National Biodiesel Board and the chairman of the ASTM Biodiesel Task Force in 1994. Uh -huh. So I've been working on it for over 25 years now. Uh, and over those last 25 years, my job has been to work with the engine companies and the petroleum companies and the fuel blenders and the regulatory agencies to do all the technical work with biodiesel, to make sure that all, everything is gonna work in a conventional diesel engine. And so that's really you know, what we've been doing over the last 25 years. Wow, so you are the guy to go to with questions. We're excited to have you on board, both of you tonight. You know, let's talk, Greg, a little bit about what the biodiesel board does and how soy checkoff dollars play a role. Sure, so the National Biodiesel Board is a trade association that oversees the bio diesel industry in the United States. And uh, we have 15 governing board members of which I am one. Uh, it's exciting because just last year we celebrated our 25th year as a trade association and we're excited about that. Looking forward to the next 25 years and the growth that the industry will bring. But uh, looking at the uh, biodiesel industry and just the, the economic impacts that it brings, uh, we'll, we'll explore those during the program today, but the soybean checkoff established the biodiesel industry in the United States. And every soybean farmer, this program would be of interest too because they are the backbone. Yes. They are the reason that biodiesel exists today. Uh, state qualified soybean boards along with the United Soybean Board has really put uh, invested the dollars into researching those technical aspects that we need to have uh, the fuel work and, and do, doing the promotion, uh, setting up uh, blender pumps and helping things get started in states where biodiesel just didn't have traction until this checkoff st stepped in and, and funded many of the projects that make biodiesel what it is today. So uh, Rudolph Diesel invented the diesel engine about Oh, in the early 1900s, over 100 years ago. And when he invented it, he actually invented it to run on vegetable oil. Huh. Peanut oil powered that, and uh, petroleum uh, diesel fuel wasn't available like it is today. But uh, we've come kind of, you know, really full circle with that. Now we're going back to products such as uh, 
soybean oil, yes. and that makes up more than half of the, the biodiesel used in the United States. Uh, corn oil, canola oil, animal fats, recycled cooking oil, a host of agricultural byproducts now that have value because we have a new uh, market for them, and it's it's exciting. But soybean farmers can really be proud of this is this is their uh, success efforts uh, being shown to light. Yeah, every soybean farmer has a stake in biodiesel, so yeah, we're excited about talking about that tonight. Now, Steve, biodiesel is in a class of its own. Talk about how it first be became the first advanced biofuel EPA recognized. Yeah. It, it is, in fact, it's it's important when we talk about biodiesel so that everyone understands what it is and what it isn't. You know, we use oils and fats to make biodiesel, but biodiesel is not a raw oil or fat. It has to be made into biodiesel through our chemical reaction. It has to meet those ASTM standards. So, because if you put raw vegetable on your engine, it'll work for a little while, but not very long, and it'll end up ruining your engine. Mm. Yeah. So that's why we have to make it into the biodiesel. And what, what we do is we take oils and fats, which are a natural, you know, product from producing protein. You know. Soybeans are 80% high protein meal and 20% oil. And we take that byproduct oil and we make it into biodiesel. And over the last 25 years, as, as Greg mentioned earlier, that soybean checkoff program funded the research and development that went into this fuel. When we first started, the engine companies said, hey, would this work in our engine? The petroleum company said, hey, can this blend in our fuel? Users said, hey, is this gonna work in our engine? So we had to do all of the research to do all of that. And the ASTM standard has changed over 20 times over the last 20 years to improve its, its product. And I, I look at it from you know, that perspective of biodiesel in the old days, you can compare to a brick phone, and biodiesel today is like an iPhone 10. <laughs> the biodiesel today is really, really great stuff. Any of the issues and problems that happened in the past are no longer issues. And people are using B20 and all sorts of equipment across the country, trouble-free all over the country. Yeah. When it comes to biodiesel, talk about the percentage that soybeans actually make up. Yeah, well, so I was just talking before the show aired about how soon this fall people will start harvesting their soybean crop and bringing it in. And if they have a semi truck, they're going to pull up to the elevator and dump, say, a thousand bushel of soybeans. Well, that alone can produce 1,500 gallons of biodiesel, wow. just the oil out of those soybeans. And so it's like tankers uh, coming up and, and, and delivering their product. And it's fueling America. It, it's showing that we can produce uh, a lot of our energy right here domestically, and it's renewable. So the fact that we can produce it every year and we can lessen our dependence on those foreign uh, imports and create jobs right here at home in America. Small towns and, and businesses can thrive uh, with this new product. That's boosting our national defense as well as it's national security it helps certainly does you know you think of all the money that is spent on national security yeah. guarding those uh, oil uh, fields and, and, and things in the Middle East and uh, and now we can start replacing some of that with uh, homegrown fuel Wow and you think about in a security standpoint we have medium-sized body plants around the country so we have kind of a distributed energy section there where if you have one refinery go out one petroleum refinery, it has ramifications across the country. And in, in a lot of cases, biodiesel can be a lot more stable source. Okay, we know that consumer acceptance can make or break a product. How significant has biodiesel been in the marketplace so far, and where do you see it going in the future? Oh, great question, because uh, Steve and I remember the days where we would uh, tote five-gallon uh, jugs around and, and uh, blend it ourselves because we just didn't have the infrastructure or the consumer acceptance. And we've grown from that in the 90s to in the early 2000s, we were moving about 25 million gallons, uh, which was a, a growth, but now we're knocking on the door of three billion gallons uh, every year and so that shows is that we're not uh, a niche market anymore we're a mainstream component of our nation's energy supply and and with that uh, you know we're we have a, a very aggressive goal you asked about the future of comprising 10 percent of our transportation market on the diesel side by the year 2022 we're on pace to do that huh. and we're excited about that and and we want to increase and, and keep ratcheting that up in the years ahead. So we're looking probably at the year 2030, about a six billion gallon market, and I think that's maybe even conservative. And uh, with heating oil on the East Coast and, and California screaming for the product they wanted immediately, if not sooner, I think it, we could even exceed that. Okay, and you know, it's interesting. It's not just something that states want. It's mass transit. It's individual communities are really catching on to the value of biodiesel. I understand it's making a big impact on mass transit systems, and you brought a video to demonstrate. We did. We did. One of the, the early markets for biodiesel and continuing market is in the mass transit system because biodiesel reduces emissions out of normal diesel engines. 
just putting biodiesel in itself reduces particulate emissions, unburned hydrocarbons, compounds that are thought to cause cancer. So you can really have some major emissions benefits and help. And that's part of the reason why, you know, folks like Medford have used the fuel. All right, yeah. let's take a look. Our Board of Education is a very progressive board. They give me and other administrators the opportunity to seek out opportunities that may be considered unconventional but effective. And biodiesel for us has just proven to be one of the many facets to our sustainable strategies. I would highly recommend that fleet owners, fleet managers across the country take the time to investigate the benefits of biodiesel fuel, also see the benefits of, of cost reduction, as well as uh, participating in the solution of energy security, environmental stewardship, and financial responsibility. That's got to feel good. It's powerful. Yeah. And they've been doing that since the mid-90s, yeah. using a B-20 in their, <laughs> in their school buses. Way ahead of the game there. You know, it's interesting, more big cities are catching on, including the biggest city in this country, New York City. Biodiesel's had a huge impact there. We've got another video to show you. Take a look. The use of biodiesel is a citywide initiative to help improve the environment and meet the New York City Clean Fleet Plan greenhouse gas reduction goals. The sanitation started using biodiesel as early as August of 2006. We started with one garage in the Bronx using B5 biodiesel blend. Biodiesel essentially is a drop in fuel, very positive results. It was a very simple way for us to become environmentally friendly. So after the success of the pilot, we slowly expanded the use of B5 throughout all 59 garages throughout the five boroughs of New York City, approximately 4,400 vehicles. And then in 2008, we expanded use of B20 citywide. The pump to sanitation uses approximately 11 million gallons of diesel fuel annually. And to date, since we started using biodiesel fuel, we've displaced over 4 million gallons of petroleum fuel. The current supplier of, of our biodiesel fuel comes from Sprague Energy. Sprague Energy is a local supplier. Through the leadership of our commissioner, Catherine Garcia, and my boss, Deputy Commissioner Rocco DeRico, it's very rewarding to know that not only are we cleaning the streets of New York City, but we're also benefiting the environment doing our jobs day in, day out. As we transition with higher blend fractions of biodiesel from B5 to B20, and hopefully someday even higher than B20, the more biodiesel we use, the less tailpipe pollution, and of course, the less greenhouse gases are being emitted with the production of biodiesel fuel. I'm a father, I have a little girl, and it's nice to know I'll look back and as our environment improved to know that, you know, I, I made a difference and my agency made a difference in helping making our air cleaner. Wow, so it's not just making a big impact in rural communities, also big cities across the country. You know, I want to know, though, um, how is the Biodiesel Board funded? I'm curious about that. Is it a voluntary effort or is it mandatory? Well, the National Biodiesel Board collects its revenue primarily uh, from the soybean checkoff yet. Uh, a little over 60% of the income comes from qualified state soybean boards uh, across the country as well as the United Soybean Board. So they would be the biggest funders. However, also the producers of, of uh, NBB who are members have volunteers dues and so that's a uh, uh depends on what, how many gallons that plant uh, puts out, and then they're assessed uh, dues for that. Uh, the soybean checkoff cannot lobby, so we cannot lobby right. for policy, but however, volume dues can, and that can, those dollars are used for uh, to help influence uh, legislation that would affect uh, biodiesel in a positive way. And then there are some government grants, uh, not many, but uh, we have a few government grants that come in as well. We do, and, and really, if it weren't for that soybean checkoff funding, you know, all of the early research, before we sold any fuel, I mean, we started started in 1993 and we literally didn't sell any fuel for about 10 years yeah. and uh, hundreds of millions of dollars have been spent for the research and development into this fuel by soybean farmers, soybean checkoff saying that we would like to develop this new fuel and that's been part of what I've been involved with is helping decide where that money should go and yeah. how to address those technical questions mm -hmm. and if it weren't for the soybean checkoff funding all this effort, we wouldn't be here today talking about almost a 3 billion gallon industry moving up to potentially 6 billion gallon 
pounds, you know, in 20, 2030. So mm -hmm. if it weren't for the soybean checkoff funds, we would not be here today. Right. So you're giving them the guidance, but I'm curious, how much is spent on research, promotion, and marketing? So we, uh, each year from a National Body Sport perspective, um, we spend money on research, we spend money on communications, and we spend money on marketing. Uh, and it's about a, a, an even split between all three of those. We spend about the same amount of research and communications and marketing uh, in a kind of an even split. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. we know that all soybean farmers have a stake in it. It's great to give them a chance to hear tonight what, where their money is going and how it's helping and how it's going to expand and help to level off that market. When we take big hits, you still increase that demand for mm -hmm. biodiesel when we're taking big hits from, say, these tariff wars or even bad weather like we've seen this year. All right, we're going to pause for a quick break, but when we come back, it's your turn to join the conversation. We want to hear from you tonight. What questions do you have about biodiesel? Maybe you have an experience to share about using biodiesel in your operation, or maybe you don't want to use it for some reason. Maybe that's a myth. Why don't you give us a call? Our experts will let you know tonight. Our numbers are open, 877-731-6733. That's 877-731-6733. More Rural America Live with the National Biodiesel Board right after this. Welcome back to Rural America Live. Tonight we're talking about the benefits of America's only advanced biofuel, biodiesel. And we want to hear from you. Maybe you're curious about how biodiesel can benefit your operation or you have an experience or a success story even to share with us. Our phone lines are open and the experts from the biodiesel board are ready to take your calls. The number is 877-731-6733. We want you to join the conversation again. That number is 877-731-6733. Three. Joining us once again is Greg Anderson and Steve Howell with the National Biodiesel Board. And we have our first caller. Calls are already lining up tonight, guys. Greg from Louisiana, we appreciate you calling in, leading us off to bat tonight. Go right ahead. Yes, I was wondering how much it costs as a gallon. And is it, where all is it located to be able to get? Okay. So he's asking about price and availability. Certainly, uh, biodiesel can fluctuate, but it, it's uh, always very competitive with your petroleum diesel. In fact, I've uh, purchased it. My last purchase was just uh, comparable. Actually, it's about five cents a gallon less than than uh, my petroleum diesel. So it's a win-win you know, situation there. But as far as availability, uh, if you can't find it, uh, I would go to biodiesel.org and you can see a list of places that uh, carry the fuel and so forth. Otherwise, ask your local fuel supplier for it and uh, pressure him or her to get biodiesel and use it, uh, offer it in their place of business. And uh, when enough farmers, I've, I've found from personal experience, when enough farmers are, are rattling the, the door and asking for the product, uh, demanding the product, uh, pretty soon uh, you'll, you'll find it available in a locale that's uh, close to you. Yeah, and I think you can feel confident in using B20 in your current operations in basically any vehicle or, or any type of, a, it has to be a diesel vehicle, of course, don't yep. put it in your gasoline vehicle. <laughs> um, but, you know, with today's fuel and the specifications we have and the quality control that we have, you can feel confident in using it in just about any piece of equipment. Right. And, you know, when prices are competitive, like you're talking about, you know it's better for the environment. You know you're helping yeah. farmers across the country. Why not? Yeah, we're using our own product. Yeah, okay. Right. Thanks for that call, Greg. We appreciate it. Caitlin from Missouri, you are our next caller. Go right ahead. Hi, yeah. I've heard that biodiesel doesn't work very well in cold climates, so mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit more about that. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thanks for thanks for that question. Yeah, we spent a lot of time and energy looking at the cold flow attributes of biodiesel as a fuel. And when people use biodiesel in a B20 blend or lower, uh, the petroleum industry and the biodiesel industry work really hard to make sure that the cold flow properties of that will work in existing cold weather. In fact, um, a case in proof of that is that the New York in New York City, LaGuardia Airport, and JFK Airport use B20 in all of the snowplow equipment, all of the emergency vehicles, the fire trucks, the ambulances, every piece of equipment in LaGuardia and, and JFK that has a diesel operation or diesel engine uses B20 year round. They use it to move snow, and that's proof positive that you can use B20 in cold weather. People have been doing it for years, and it's really, again, due to those specifications and the quality control that all our industry has put into place, 
you know, we really are an iPhone 10 now, where in the past we might have been a brick phone. Now we're an iPhone 10, and you can feel confident in this fuel. And I have had the, the head of Port Authority just say, hey, if anybody doesn't believe that they can use B20 in the wintertime, here's my business card, have them call me, and I'll tell them otherwise. And so that's a, a tremendous testimony to the integrity of the fuel and the confidence that consumers have. You know, what about if it sits in the tank for a long time? Say you're not driving it a lot during the winter months. Is that going to hurt the engine at all? So, you know, part of my job as the chairman of the ASTM group is to address questions and issues like that. And yes. what we did when we set up the specifications is we set them up to have a, a minimum shelf life of six months. Most of it was over a year. And the product today, we just did a bunch of new measurements. And all the product today had a shelf life of a minimum of a year. And most of it had a, a shelf life of over three years. Wow. So that's been a real big improvement. And again, that's due to all the quality controls and the specifications we put into place. And, and you can feel confident with, the, you know, with that with today's fuel. You yeah. can store it, it sounds like, as well. Absolutely. Can. Okay. Mm -hmm. Margaret from Illinois, you are our next caller. Thanks for joining the conversation. Go right ahead. Hi. I heard you guys talk earlier about Rudolph Diesel using peanut oil in uh, the first cars. Why can't I just use recycled cooking oil in, um, in my truck instead of having to buy diesel fuel? So I, I, can, I can certainly take that one. You know, that's, that's part of the work that we did really early on is to figure out what changes needed to happen with the vegetable oil to make it work in a diesel engine. And the bottom line is the vegetable oil is about 10 times as thick. 10 times as viscous as regular diesel fuel. So when it squirts in the cylinder, it doesn't you know, atomize as well as regular diesel fuel. And over time, that will cause injector coking. It will cause filter clogging problems. It will cause engine oil problems. It will cause lacquer you know, in your engine system. You know, think about your popcorn popper. What does your popcorn popper look like from the vegetable oil that gets cooked in your popcorn <laughs> popper? You know, you don't want that in the inside of your cylinder or your diesel engine. So that's why you have to turn it into body. So when we, when we make body, so we take that material, that vegetable oil that's 10 times as thick and make it, it really, we reduce that thickness by 10 times so the, the viscosity is the same as regular diesel fuel. Yeah. And that's why you have to turn it into biodiesel in order to make a good fuel. Because the biodiesel properties, if you go down and look at all the specification properties that we have for B20, those properties are exactly the same as conventional diesel fuel. And we added a couple extra just to make sure the biodiesel was produced properly. Huh. Yeah. So that's why B20 works in an existing piece of equipment. It meets the same specs as regular diesel fuel. Mm -hmm. Great analogy there too with the yeah. popcorn popper. Appreciate <laughs> that because what you're talking about is complicated and so when you simplify things like that it makes it easier yeah. for us all to understand. We appreciate that. Okay, that leaves a line open for you. 877-731-6733 is the number to call and join our conversation. Mike from Michigan is up next. Thanks for joining us, Mike. Go right ahead. Hey, thanks. Hey, um, yeah, we have a a few gas stations, uh, and we're all about promoting biodiesel, and uh, we do we sell a lot of E85 and ethanol. And um, problem we've had with uh, the biodiesel is it, it plugs up our our pumps, our filters, and we haven't had a lot of problems with equipment. We also do construction in our you know, our trucks and our dozers and everything haven't had a problem, but um, I'm wondering why, you know, I, I change filters twice a year on the on the fossil diesel, but, you know, with the biodiesel, it's like twice a month. Um, I don't know if it's a moisture or what's going on with that, but we kind of give it up because of that. So can you tell me uh, how, how long ago it was that you had those type of filter clogging issues? Well, uh, we, we didn't do any bio do so this year. So it's last year and the year before. Um, but yeah, it went from, you know, changing filters twice a year to changing them twice a month. Well, so what, what the, there's a couple of potential, you know, explanations for that. You know, one is that, you know, the, the, the fuel supplier that's doing the fuel needs to make sure that they, they properly treat the biodiesel to make sure they have the right biodiesel and the right, um, the right blend of biodiesel and diesel fuel. And most of the suppliers now have gotten really good at that. So we don't see, in most cases, very many changes uh, com compared to normal diesel fuel. You know, the, the folks in New York are using it, world, you know, year-round with the B20 with no issues. Um, so you might 
check with your fuel supplier on, on what types of things that they're doing there. The other thing is that we need to make sure that, that you're buying, you know, that your fuel supplier is getting stuff from a BQ9000 company. Yeah. That's a real major thing. Some people, um, you know, are still using the raw vegetable every once in a while, not, you know, real good conventional body on that. That will cause some potential issues. Mm -hmm. So those are all things that you can check into. Um, we do know that, that most of the suppliers out there are really getting really good at providing that blend and you should not be seeing uh, any extra filter changes you know once you once you start up on the b20 provided that they've done a good job now right. it could be potentially that you're in a really really cold area and if it gets to minus 20 or minus 25 regular diesel fuel has issues so it might just be a regular diesel fuel cold flow issue so there's a whole variety of things that you can check into and we'd be happy to you know to help you out with that you know you know after the show yeah. Okay. You can also visit biodiesel.org if you'd like more information as well. Okay. We're going to go back to the phones. George from Oklahoma, you are our next caller. Go right ahead. I'd like to know if it's feasible to make your own biodiesel and how expensive would it normally be? I can do it. I can do it. Okay, he said that he's wondering how, if he could make his own biodiesel and how expensive it would be oh. to do so. Yeah. Uh, personally, I wouldn't, uh, just because of the things that Steve has talked about. We want to avoid any issues, and to do this uh, right, you need to uh, follow, the, you know, the transesterification process. That is a is a very chemical process uh, done once uh, if you're using a feedstock such as uh, soybean oil or corn oil or what have you, uh, and just buy it uh, from a BQ9000 uh, supplier. That's the safest way. And Steve, you can answer, you know, add to some of that. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's possible that some people in the early days did make it in in their garage or in their basement. What they found is it, it it's fairly easy to make it, you know, a, a semi -bi biodiesel yeah. but it's it's really hard to make one that meets the specification unless you have all the professional equipment and all the the good things that the, the larger body so plants have so so it, it's it ends up being less expensive and less time consuming and you get a better product if you just buy it you know on the open market than try and do it yourself right? okay so it's more economically feasible to just yes. go to a service station and buy it on the open market okay yeah. excellent appreciate that call thank you very much for joining us George next up we have Dean from Missouri Go right ahead, Dean. Yes, good evening. I enjoy your program. I had a question. I understand that the uh, government subsidizes the oil companies on ethanol, and I'm wondering if they're subsidizing the biodiesel. Well, you know, we, we talk about subsidies, and we think of big oil who's had uh, subsidies in place uh, for 100 years or more and it continues. We've had a tax incentive that has expired. It's been expired for about a year and a half now, and that was a dollar a gallon. And uh, some of our folks in Washington, D.C. are working hard, talking with their senators and congressmen to, uh, hey, give us a level playing field. Yeah. If big oil has a tax incentive, well, then we need a place at the table, too, because of our growing uh, importance in our nation's fuel supply. Yeah, that's right, especially when you talk about the small refinery waivers and all yes. the issues that have come up around that. Yes, we figure that small refinery waivers just alone has demand destruction of about 360 million gallons. I think that's actually kind of conservative. I put it more at about a half a billion gallons. Wow. So that's important. Uh, we, we would like uh, EPA to let the renewable fuel standard uh, is in place. Let's let it work as it was intended to be. Okay. That's always a big topic on our Market Day report. It is, yes. <laughs> that leaves a line open for you. 877-731-6733 is the number to call. We're going to go to Texas this time to talk to Eldon. Thanks for joining the conversation, Eldon. Go right ahead. Want to be on TV? Turn it up to the... <laughs> Eldon, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. I was telling my wife. <laughs> go, go right ahead with your question. <laughs> Okay, my question is this. Uh, we're here in South Texas, and we use mostly diesel and uh, electricity to farm corn and mostly peanuts and, and uh, our crops, you know. Why, if we have to use electricity or diesel to make fuel, it's kind of like chicken and egg, you know. What do, you, what, what, what do we start with first? And what is economics of using electricity and diesel to make biodiesel? I've never had anyone to answer me that question. But what, what is the, the cost? And, uh, why didn't we just use, I mean, why couldn't we 
use the, the fuel that we're using, which is storable, and we uh, buy it and uh, transport boats to irrigate. Our main fuel here is irrigation and, of course, tractors. You know. And uh, I guess that's a dumb question, but that, mm -hmm. I've never heard of that. So I, I think from a, a Texas standpoint, you, you may not be aware that Texas is actually one of the top biodiesel producing states in the country. The Houston Ship Channel has an awful lot of chemical production, uh, and, and we have a lot of biodiesel in that area, uh, down in the Texas area. And Texas actually has a state incentive uh, that's available that makes biodiesel um, pricing a very similar, if not less, than diesel fuel. So y y in the Texas area, you should be able to, to, to get that product and get it at a, a pretty favorable price. And of course, if you get you know the good stuff from a BQ9000 company, it'll, it'll, it'll make sure that it's going to work well in your, in your diesel engine. You know, one of the things when you, when you talk about electricity um, that, you know, a lot of people are looking at going to electricity, uh, and if you go to electricity, you're going to have to buy a new vehicle or you're going to have to put in an, a new heating system. And if you use biodiesel in your existing home heating oil system or your existing engine, you can reduce that carbon because uh, that's one of the main reasons why people use electricity is to reduce carbon because electricity is supposed to be carbon free, at least if it's from wind and solar. Well, biodiesel has an 80% carbon reduction because the CO2 in the air grows a plant or an animal, and then we take that and make it into an oil, and then we make it into bodies, and we put that CO2 back into the air. So we have an 80% reduction in carbon. So you can get that carbon reduction from electricity by using your existing diesel engine equipment and just putting bodies in those engines. Oh, so you, yeah. I think that's what his main point was, why should I switch from diesel to biodiesel? And you can see mm -hmm. here, it's, it's the renewable diesel. It improves the environment. But that's not just it. You're supporting farmers across the country as well. Talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, it's big as a farmer. You know, with uh, biodiesel adds about 63 cents per bushel for every soybean uh, uh, bushel I grow, and about 37 dollars per acre. That's so that's huge. Yeah. yeah, that's very significant in this day and age. And and uh, you know, it's it's uh, bringing value to our livestock uh, operators as well. Just simply with the carcass value when you're using uh, animal fats uh, such as beef tallow for biodiesel feedstock, it's adding about 10 to 12 dollars per head. For every beef animal, about a dollar to a dollar twenty-five for swine per head, so that's that's uh, large as well. That factors in, and then it's reducing this, the cost of soybean meal to those people who feed uh, soybean meal to uh, their livestock, whether it be pork or poultry, uh, by about twenty to forty dollars per ton. And Ooh. it's over from two thousand six to two thousand, I, I believe, uh, sixteen, about ten-year period. There has saved America uh, livestock producers about five billion dollars, and so in just in feed costs. Mm -hmm. So. So it's 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 huge for both uh, farmers and ranchers. Um, people say, well, it just benefits the soybean producers. Uh, it does, but it pr produces uh, value for every uh, aspect of agriculture out there, wh whatever crop they grow. And uh, being an oil seed, uh, lots of things can be uh, made into uh, biodiesel as a feedstock. We've, we're seeing canola being a very important part in the northern states. We're seeing uh, beef tallow and such in the southern states. Uh, you know, soybean in the middle states. So it. it brings communities together and brings the agriculture together and that all working towards one goal. Okay, excellent, excellent. It's so great to have two experts like you answering questions. We've had a lot of great ones so far and we're gonna keep them going, but first we have to pause for a quick break. When we come back, we wanna hear from you. Give us a call with your questions and comments about biodiesel. Make sure that biodiesel is right for you. If you've been maybe on the fence about trying it, maybe you heard something in the past, well, let our experts debunk that myth. They're gonna tell you why, set the record straight as we continue on tonight. Our phone lines are open 877-731-6733, 877-731-6733. Call in with your questions or your comments and we'll be right back with more Rural America Live with the National Biodiesel Board right after this. Welcome back to Rural America Live. Tonight we are taking a look at the benefits of using biodiesel fuel in today's ag industry. And we want to hear from you. The number to call is 877-731-6733. Do you have a question about using biodiesel? Maybe you're curious as how it could benefit your farm or ranch. Or maybe you have a question about how it would perform in your diesel engine. Give us a call, 877-731-6733. We're going to go straight to the phones. Lynn from Texas, thanks for joining the conversation. Go right ahead. 
Uh, what I'm wondering, we add additives to our diesel fuel now. Does it help on that upper end lubrication that we used to get from the old fuel? Well, I'll start off and I want to let Steve really tackle that question first and foremost. But when the government took uh, basically removed sulfur from the diesel fuel, we were at 500 parts per million, took it down to 15 parts per million. It made it uh, more uh, you know, efficient as far as the environment, but it really made it a dry fuel. So adding a B, even a 2% blend virtually solves that lubricity problem. And it, it has for me and, and every one of us who have diesel engines know that they're very expensive to uh, service and maintain. We want to make those long uh, lasting. But uh, Steve has a lot of information on that lubricity issue and, and some of the testing that you've done. Yeah, we, we do. And in fact, you know, that's one of the major reasons why body is being blended in to petroleum based fuels right now, because every ultra low sulfur diesel fuel has to have some sort of lubricity additive. And if you put just a minimum of 2% biodiesel in, you know, that solves the lubricity issue with even the worst you know, jet fuel type Canadian, JP8, really dry fuel. Um, and what a, a petroleum company can do, they used to have to add additives. If they just do ultra low sulfur diesel by itself, you have to add an additive. If you put biodiesel in there, you don't need that additive anymore. You can actually save the money from that additive by just putting biodiesel in because that's one of the benefits it brings to the table. I mean, if you add biodiesel to a diesel fuel, you increase the cetane number, you reduce the aromatics, you know, that's some of the compounds thought to cause cancer in diesel exhaust. It burns a lot cleaner. It's already ultra low sulfur. So you add all those great things, great cetane, great lubricity, you know, cetane being that kind of diesel equivalent of octane for gasoline for those of your audience that may not be familiar with that. Um, so it's just a really great diesel fuel. And that lubricity factor you just mentioned there is one of the keys why we're seeing biodiesel blends in the market today. Because if you had at least 2% biodiesel, you solve the lubricity issue. Great question. We appreciate that. Lynn from Texas, thanks for the call. That leaves a line open for you, 877-731-6733. Again, that number is 877-731-6733. We're going to go back to the phones in just a moment, but let's talk about some of the market drivers for fuel now versus, say, 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Well, we're, you know, of course, you know, there's a lot of questions about you know, people wanting to go to wind and solar. Mm -hmm. We're seeing that as a, as a big market driver in various areas. And, and when biodiesel, we, we take solar energy from the sun and carbon dioxide from the air, and we make an oil, and then we turn that into a fuel. So basically what we do is rather than having a battery and electricity, we store that, you know, that solar energy from the sun, we store it in biodiesel. So we really look at biodiesel as liquid solar energy, low carbon liquid solar energy. That's one of the major driving forces that we're seeing in today's market. You know, it, it works in existing engines. You don't have to switch out. If you want to go to a low carbon fuel that uses solar energy, use biodiesel. Biodiesel is liquid solar energy. <laughs> So that's a, a market that we're really seeing now. You can use it in your existing equipment. You don't have to switch to a new engine, a new vehicle, a new electric heat pump that doesn't even work in the cold weather half the time. So you don't have to do all that. You can put biodiesel in your existing systems and utilize that without doing all those changes and still get the benefits from low carbon that you would get with you know another version of solar energy, i.e. electricity from wind and solar. Wow. And talk about renewable and sustainable. Uh, here soon, uh, soybean farmers will be harvesting their crop. Yep. I'm going to be using biodiesel blend in my combine, and I'm harvesting actually the feedstock to make more biodiesel, being powered by, uh, by, by you know, a combine <laughs> that's uh, already powered by biodiesel. Wow. It's great. Yeah. It's uh, looking at a soybean field much like an oil field, because that's really truly what it is. It's a fuel field. And uh, it's, it's uh, America's advanced biofuel. There are so many advantages to it. And, you know, the fact that you don't have to add anything to your diesel tank. It's ready yeah. to go already, right now. And we're talking about yeah. for combines, mm -hmm. for, for planting equipment, for anything yeah. you need around the farm. Talk about what other big vehicles can use biodiesel. So basically, you can use biodiesel in any application that has as a regular diesel engine. So marine applications, big you know, ships, uh, railroads, um, you can use that in, in almost, well, in every diesel application. So we see it being used for snow plows you know, in New York City. We see it be used for you know, all sorts of agricultural equipment. You know, the big mining equipment, you know, uh, almost all the underground mining equipment is diesel powered. Yep. So we see diesel in the underground mines. Wow. And, and so it, it's, it's kind of ubiquitous. Anywhere you see a diesel engine, 
you know, military equipment on mm -hmm. military bases. They run on diesel. So we use by B-20 in a lot of military bases. Yeah. You know, we use B-20 in garbage trucks running in the inner city, and they reduce the pollution in the inner city, and you know how smoky those garbage trucks are yeah. sometimes. <laughs> so it's a, it's a real great combination of, of things that we do in rural America that also help the cities, and it helps c connect, yes. you know, the rural America to the cities, and it's a real, you know, win-win for both. Absolutely. I'll tell you a story. When I was speaking to some uh, groups of uh, oil heat dealers in Boston, and we were out at Fenway Park, and I asked, how many of you have ever seen a soybean uh, field? And about three or four hands out of 150 went up. You know, they just didn't get the connection. So I told the story of how the soybean checkoff established the biodiesel industry in the United States, and now we have the technology and, and the opportunity now to blend biodiesel with heating oil. And some of the folks had already started to use that and were selling it and replaced uh, their oil heat business now with bioheat. And one guy came up to me and said, thank you for saving my business. Thank you, <laughs> American farmers, for saving my business because we were in competition with natural gas. And now that we're selling B20, we can prove that we're even more efficient and cleaner than natural gas. And I thought that was a great connection. You know, these oil heat dealers are family businesses. And some of those are generational, just like I'm a generational farmer. Uh, the grandpa sold uh, uh, coal. The father sold oil heat, and now the son is taking over the business and selling bioheat. So it's a great story, a lot of connections, a lot of similarities there with weather affecting both markets. Yes. Uh, they need cold weather to have a good year. We need uh, you know, a good growing season to grow a good crop. And so we found a lot of commonalities there. Wow. OK, we're going to go back to the phones. David from Colorado, thanks for joining the conversation. Go right ahead. Yeah, I've kind of got two questions. It's kind of like. How is the Trump administration? Are they really back in this? And how was the Obama administration? Who's backing it more? And are they really, really behind this? Well, we've had good support Bio from both parties. Uh, you know, biodiesel is not a, a red fuel. It's not a blue fuel. It's America's advanced biofuel. And, uh, you know, we have uh, a president now who's endorsed uh, biofuels and has uh, Pledge to his support with that. Um, I think if I had, uh, you know, an opportunity to sit down with the president, I would ask him to uh, look at uh, making sure that the EPA uh, is set to make sure that those volume requirements are raised every year. We have the production capacity ready to go. We need those volume levels raised for the RFS to work just as it was properly designed to. And then to put a, a, you know, uh, a stop to these small refinery uh, uh, exemptions that are being handed out uh, very liberally by the EPA. I think with that, though, we'll see both parties uh, in their campaign trails in this next year or so, uh, rightfully so, in endorsing biodiesel. And they see the benefits of it. They know that it supports American jobs. And it seems like jobs, jobs, jobs is the thing that resonates with their minds as they look at uh, all these opportunities. And certainly, it has a great story to tell for carbon uh, you know, uh, reduction. And uh, just our energy security is very important, too, in the scope of things. And the, the nice thing is, you know, whether there's a Republican administration or a Democratic administration, you know, each, each group tends to like certain things about biodiesel more or less. You know, sometimes the environmental benefits are more, sometimes the job creation is more. But the nice thing about biodiesel has something for everyone to yes. like. And we see support across the board. In fact, yeah. some of the, the major issues we have is, is everybody wants to do positive biodiesel legislation and support, but then they argue about trying to attach some of the other things to our bills <laughs> yeah. because they know the biodiesel is going to pass because everybody likes it so they attach you know all this other stuff they can't get past to some of our legislation so yeah. it's being a, a good thing for both parties can actually be a bad thing in some <laughs> cases um, so that's a really great question I'm glad I'm glad yeah. you asked that yeah, question. Good question yeah all right thank you David we appreciate that next up we have Doug from Iowa thanks for joining us Doug go right ahead okay I have a question I'm a bus driver and they will not use biodiesel in our school system can you explain to them why they need to? And I really didn't get into all the reasons why they don't. But one of them is trailing. But what is the solution on? On what is the? Uh, how can I sell biodiesel to the school system? Okay, well, that is that is an absolutely great question. And, you know, in the early days, you know, we did have some problems with some of the companies not making biodiesel to spec and some other things. 
So there were some filter clogging problems in some of the early days. And I think what you can say to, 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 you know, to the folks that you, know, that you report to is that some of those early issues that we did have with filter clogging back in the 2000s, you know, those issues have now been solved. We have changed the biodiesel specifications. You know, we are not seeing filter clogging with fuel that meets the biodiesel specs that's produced by a BK9000 company. So I think getting that good quality fuel, you know, addresses some of those questions that they might still have uh, from, frankly, from years ago. Again, you know, kind of that, that analogy, we, we have an iPhone 10 now for a fuel rather than a brick phone, and, and we really do have good fuel that, that are not having problems. I think the other things you can do, especially being from Iowa, that's where I grew up, um, is you're supporting the rural economy, you're cleaning up the emissions from school buses, and, you know, children are some of the, the, the ones that are most sensitive to asthma and all sorts of, yes. of lung air issues, and using bodies from those school buses can really improve those emissions. And you're also, you know, reducing the carbon. So if you use B20, it's 16% less carbon than regular diesel fuel. And that's gonna be important for school kids when they grow up, you know, and, and have a, you know, a low carbon fuel that they can rely on. So it's, it's local jobs, it's the environment, you know, it's fuel that works well in a diesel engine, uh, and especially all the new diesel engines. Um, so we've, we've spent a lot of time on that, um, working on new diesel engines. And so I, I think you can use all of those things to, to go uh, to, to your folks and, and see if you can talk them into using bodies. Because really, with today's area, especially in Iowa, there's other incentives that are out there. There's no reason why you shouldn't be using B20 in your school buses. You know, it's interesting. That's why doing a show like this is so important. But what are some other ways that we can increase the education across the country? Because I think if more people were really aware of the value that biodiesel has to offer, they'd hop right on board. Yeah, you know, education is it with everything. And, and certainly as uh, even our viewers today can go to biodiesel.org and find a host of information there, I think that would answer questions that we won't have time to answer here in this fast paced hour. But uh, just uh, talking to others who have used it, I think sometimes that firsthand experience of a uh, neighbor down the road, hey, do you use biodiesel? Yeah, I, I do. And then get his story or, or her story. Uh, it's kind of been true with me as I have used it. And I, I have never found anyone who has been solely petroleum uh, diesel, switch to a biodiesel blend and then not like it and go back to petroleum. I've, I've, never, I've wow. yet to met that, <laughs> that farmer or rancher who has had that experience. Uh, it's always the other way. They're embracing biodiesel once they use it, they see the benefits of it, how it really is you know, supporting their uh, future as a farmer or a rancher for economically as well as all the environmental benefits that we've been talking about. And so that's a good testimony, a great question. And that education process continues. Okay. John from K Kansas, thanks for joining the conversation. Go right ahead. Is there uh, any quality control? If, if we buy a load of biodiesel here in Kiowa, uh, is it all going to be sold under the same quality control regardless of the supplier? So I, I can uh, I can take that one, um, you know, being the chairman of the ASTM standards <laughs> group. Uh, um, so in Iowa, you know, you're you're uh, you're in a good position in Iowa because the the companies that produce bodies in Iowa are part of that BQ9000 quality program. So that's really the key. And 90 percent of the production out there is under that BQ9000 quality program now. So if you're buying, you know, fuel from one of those companies, it's in that BK9000 program, you can be assured that they're going to meet the spec because they have to go through an audit every year, they have to guarantee they meet the spec, and they have to physically analyze each batch. So, um, so I think that's the key, and you know, with over 90% of the companies in that program now, uh, and with, you know, in addition to that, you know, the, in order to sell biodiesel, it has to meet the spec according to the EPA and according to the IRS. And if you sell an out-of-spec fuel, it's a potential $32,000 per year fine to wow. sell an out-of-spec biodiesel. Huh. Yeah. So, you know, we've got it approved through EPA and through ASTM and through IRS and, and through all of these groups. And, you know, there's some severe penalties and, and each group within the, the, the system under the weights and measures groups actually can enforce those specifications. And we actually go out and ask those companies to enforce the specifications to make sure things are going well. I'm, I'm not familiar with very many other industries that have actually asked the regulatory bodies to enforce the specs on them more. <laughs> and we certainly have. 
So, uh, so I think the answer to your question is yes, and especially in Iowa, I think you can feel good about the quality control there. I, I think John's from Kansas, but that would be true Kansas, thank you. Yeah, yes. of any state, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Good, good, mm -hmm. good. Okay, I think this is going to be our last caller. This hour is flying by. Ken from New Mexico, thanks for joining us. Go right ahead. Hello, I have farming and ranching interests and benefit from the byproducts of biodiesel. My main question is whether biodiesel is self-sustaining. How many acres of corn or soybeans does it take to produce enough fuel to grow an acre of corn or soybeans? Assuming no other fuel is available. Okay, I think if I if I uh, understand you, Ken, uh, thinking about uh, actually the oil from soybean oil. Let's just use soybeans for example. Uh, we're about 20 20 percent of that is the oil. 80 percent of that's going to be high protein meal. So we're going to have that oil regardless if we grow, you know. 70 million acres or 90 million acres of beans, we're going to have oil to use. And if we don't have industrial way of using it, such as biodiesel, uh, we're not going to have a home for that product. We're not going to have a market for that product. Secondly, I think we'd like to bring out that biodiesel has a 5.58 to 1 energy balance, which is the highest of any liquid uh, fuel out there. And so it, for every unit of energy used to to produce biodiesel, it produces more than five times what it takes to make it. And there's no other fuel that even comes close to that. Yep, that's right. Yeah, he's, he was getting pretty mathematical. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> but I think what's happening is we're starting a dialogue. We're getting people interested in something they may not have been aware of before, yeah. which is, you know, it's a little unusual because you think of the ag community, everybody is kind of kept up to speed with mm -hmm. everything, but maybe not so much with biodiesel, which goes to show we've got to do more shows just like this in the future. Now, before yeah. we do wrap up tonight, do you have any final thoughts for us? Let's start with you. Sure. Well, thank you, Christine. It's been great to have this uh, program and talk about biodiesel. I was just maybe end by saying bi biodiesel is not a niche market anymore. We're a mainstream component of our nation's fuel uh, and energy security our energy supply. It's uh, growing. It's uh, producing economic value to the people who are growing the feedstock all the way to the people who are selling it and using it. And it's really fueling America. And we can be very proud of the fact that, that we have this new advanced biofuel that's making a difference. Absolutely. Steve, your final thoughts. Yeah, I just like to make sure, you know, your viewers know that that over the past 25 years, we've honed in on the specifications and we really do have a great fuel today. We spent over $150 million of checkoff money to do the research and development. You know, virtually every engine company supports B20 and all their engines. And we've had millions and millions of miles of successful B20 use. So I think your, your, your audience out there can feel confident with today's biodiesel that you can use B20 in your existing equipment and then you can have all the benefits that that brings. You know, all the solar energy liquid benefits, you know, biodiesel being a low carbon, you know, basically solar fuel. Um, you can you get all those benefits and feel confident that you can use this fuel without problems and you can use it in your existing equipment without making any change. That's a big thing and a big deal and we're gonna see more of it in the future. Mm -hmm. We're looking forward to the future as well. We have just a few moments left. I just wanted to ask you, where do you see the future of this industry going, mm. say in the next five years? Sure, I, I really feel we're gonna meet our goal of 10% of the nation's uh, domestic uh, transportation fuel powered by diesel with biodiesel by the year 2022. We're on pace to do that. You know, and, and uh, the sky's the limit. We're seeing that market for bioheat that we didn't even dream of 10 years ago to be a reality today. So uh, with the coasts using it and the, everybody in the middle of the farmers and ranchers using it, we have a bright future ahead. Bright future ahead, supporting farmers, the hard workers across this great nation as well, improving national security, helping the environment. You really just can't go wrong when it comes to biodiesel. All right, we want to thank you for joining us tonight on Rural America Live. Remember, if you'd like more information, all you have to do is visit biodiesel.org. It's been a great show. You were a big part of it. Good night from Rural America's most important network.